You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria. And you are listening to your favorite international podcast. Mm -hmm, That's right. We're the best. Yeah, no. But thank you really sincerely to everyone who has left us the nicest reviews and ratings. We are getting really close to my personal goal of 1000 ratings on iTunes USA. That does not mean we don't read and appreciate every review from every country around the world because we very sincerely do. But I just want to hit that like 1K, you know, when you see the K instead of 970 reviews, we're 30 away. I just now realized that we have three reviews on IMDb. We have three reviews on IMDb? Yep. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Also, if you could keep voting for us in the podcast magazine Hot 50 charts, that would be amazing. You can vote once per day for your top three favorite podcasts, and you can do that by going to podcastmagazine.com slash hot5050, and please vote for us as your, as your top three. You can, you get two more you can put in there too, so go for it, please. We would be so grateful. That would be super. Yes. Please, Annie's goal is the 1,000 ratings, and my goal is being in the top 10 at least once. And we know how amazing you are in supporting this podcast, and you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we're so grateful, really. And of course, we also want to give a very special shout out to our newest patrons, Sonia Sweet. Hi, Sonia. And Jen Dexter. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much, really. Quick, some words about some organizational stuff. If you are a murder to your patron and you haven't received your pin yet because somebody messaged me a couple of days ago, oh. even though you joined over six weeks ago, please, please contact us. Let us know that you never received yours. I think sometimes they get lost in the mail. I don't know if it has something to do with the shape they make in the envelope. Yeah. It's just a wild guess, but there's something going on. There is. Yeah. I even sent some out as a test, like just to my dad's house and other like close friends to say like, will you call me when you get this thing to see? I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And of the five I sent out, only two received them. So I don't know what's going on, but we want to make sure that you do get them. So if you have been um, a murder tier patron for at least a month and you haven't received a pin, like Johanna was saying, please just shoot us a message and we're going to keep sending those suckers out to you until you finally get one. It'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. Please, via Patreon would be best if you send us a message via Patreon. Thank you. So we have kind of an overview of what's going on. Thank you so much. Also, Annie will not be with us for the upcoming two weeks. I know, witness protection. Mm. No, I, you know, I'm definitely going to miss talking to you about murder, but my sister and brother-in-law and my nephew and his gorgeous girlfriend, who I haven't met yet, are coming over from the UK to visit. And so I just really want to be fully present and enjoy my time with them when they're here. So. Of course. Yeah. I mean, obviously. And you will be back for the episode that drops on 22nd of June, which will be here in no time. That's right. Yeah. I'll be back. You know, it's not as good as when you say that phrase. I think it's sort of a disappointment when the American <laughs> says, I'll it. be back. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say it. Everyone can hear it. It is also actually quite possible that there won't be an episode next week because I too will have a visitor. Oh, My nice. aunt is coming for three days and it's exactly those days when we usually work on the podcast. So in case I don't find time over the next weekend to research, record and edit... Uh, there will be no episode on 8th of June, but definitely the week after that. So yeah. just heads up. Yeah. Yeah. No, you need to spend time with your aunt. That's awesome. Part of my problem is I'm not sure where we're going to be. Like I know at some point we're going to go down to the Cape and stay with my dad. and um, But we're just being flexible and sort of watching the weather. So if I'm home and the stars align, I may text you and say, hey, I can record. But I think our listeners will understand that we might miss an episode definitely. from time to time. Yeah. All right. I think that's all, folks. Bye. (laughs) See ya. No. Uh, Let's get into today's episode. I'm very confident to say that we never 
covered a case like this before. I can't wait. I'm excited. So, it was on the 25th of April 2007 in Heilbronn, which is a town in the south of Germany, in Baden-Württemberg. Two police officers, a woman named Michelle Kiesewetter, she was 22, and her male partner, her colleague, the 24-year-old Martin A, or A, uh, his last name has not been made public for privacy reasons. Mm. So, the two had parked a patrol car they were driving that day at the so-called Theresienwiese, which is an outdoor event ground in Heilbronn. You know, think of the places where you would set up a fair or a carnival, something like that. Yes, fairgrounds. They wanted to take their lunch break. And around 2 p.m., some people who are nearby hear gunshots. Now, Heilbronn is a quiet town with a low crime rate, and I'm pretty sure that nobody was expecting something malicious behind these noises. But they are wrong, and soon enough, the source of the shots is found. Officer Kiesewetter is dead, killed by a headshot, and the other officer is shot in the head as well. But he survives the attack, though heavily injured, and later he will have no memory of the attack. Also, both of their guns are missing. But the question is, who shoots two young police officers in the middle of the day? Was it a robbery gone wrong? Did they cross the path of someone on the run? Or was it a planned murder? The investigators formed a special investigation commission, Parkplatz, which translates to parking lot, to find the attacker of their colleagues. They search the scene, they dust for fingerprints, they swipe for DNA, and they actually find something. They find traces of DNA on the car. DNA that doesn't belong to the two victims. And when they run it through the data bank, they soon find that this murder is not the first time that this DNA was found at a crime scene. The DNA belongs to an unknown woman who seems to be responsible for a long list of different crimes that date back as far as 1993. So, in total, over the years, the DNA of this woman will be found over 40 times. Wow. And a woman. Okay. Right? I mean, we have female perpetrators all the time, but shooting two police officers point blank in the middle of the day in public, it's a little bit of a surprise, definitely. Yeah. Now, let's list the crimes where they found DNA traces of this woman in kind of a chronological order, shall we? Yes, please. So, on 26th of May 1993 in Ida oberstein which is a town in Rheinland-Pfalz, the 62-year-old Lieselotte S. is found dead in her apartment. The retired woman, who was living alone, had been strangled with a piece of wire. The wire is found at the crime scene. Her closets and cupboards have been ransacked, so everything points to a robbery with a murder, but the door shows no sign of a break-in. Did the woman, who lived isolated and didn't trust strangers, know her murderer and open the door herself? And of course, in 1993, the use of DNA analysis is still in its infancy, but the evidence is stored, and in 2001, investigators take another look, and the DNA found on the wire is tested, and it belongs to a man. But there is one other DNA sample found on a mug in Lieselotte's kitchen. This DNA belongs to a woman, and it's going to be the first time that the mysterious woman is connected to a crime. On 24th of May 2001 in Freiburg, a 60-year-old ex-convict, Josef W., is strangled with three of his own belts. No fingerprints or DNA are found on the belts, but the mystery DNA is found through sweat stains on one of the kitchen drawers in the apartment. Nothing seems to be missing, and again, the door shows no sign of a break-in. Neighbors describe the victim as an introvert who never had visitors over. In October of 2001, the DNA is found on a syringe that was used for heroin consumption. The syringe was found by a young boy who stepped on it while playing in the woods. Oh, God. I think that's also why they tested it, because they wanted to make sure that, you know, yeah, didn't transmit any diseases to the, to the child. On 25th of October 2001, someone breaks into an RV in Budenheim, which is a small town, again, in Rheinland-Pfalz. Nothing is missing, nothing is vandalized, so I honestly don't know exactly why they even tested for DNA, but they did. And the mystery woman's DNA is found on a half-eaten cookie. Okay. Um, that one is super... So somebody broke into an RV and all they did was eat half a cookie. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. And, and they tested for DNA, which is... Okay. That seems kind excessive. Of what kind of budget do they have? 
In April of 2004, again in Freiburg, in the office of a homeless shelter, someone welded the safe open. A few thousand euros in cash and tokens are stolen. The investigators find a half-empty bottle of water at the scene and test it for DNA. And what do they find? Bingo, the DNA of the mystery woman. Who is this woman? Why have I not seen her Lifetime television special? So she's not only a murderer and a robber or a burglar, but she's also a safe cracker. She's an expert. She's like, well, who was it in the Italian job? The safe cracker. <laughs> What's happening? At least she's an accomplice in all of this. Kind right. Of. So she wouldn't have to do all of these things alone, especially that whole bite of a cookie. She probably had help for that one. But we do know that they found male DNA on that wire, was it? They found it in the first murder, right? There was male DNA. Yeah. But if that was a homeless shelter, was she there as a guest? And if she was found on that needle, then she was using heroin and breaking into RVs and stealing nothing. So maybe she was homeless, and that's why the bottle was there? So that's another possibility that the bottle was there unconnected to the crime, right? Right. Okay. What's next? In April of 2004, two precious stone traders are robbed at gunpoint in Arbois, which is a city in eastern France. In the homes of one of the victims, the investigators find a toy gun and on it the DNA of the mystery woman. Okay. Fine. <laughs> but how? Like, how? This is... Wow. Okay. How did it get there? Well... That's the million dollar question, right? Well, so in that, I mean, one, they even had the had the guys who robbed the the the, the gemstone traders. They right. had the guys. Oh, they caught. Okay, and so the guys didn't know anything about a woman, or claimed not to know anything about a woman working with them. Nope. Nope. Wow. So someone must someone must have seen her. Nobody. Nobody has seen her. Not one witness in any of the crimes so far has seen a woman. Okay. So, she's, sneaky. she's, she's very mysterious. <laughs> Super sneaky. Criminal mastermind. <laughs> On 6th of May 2005 in Worms, which is again a city in Rheinland-Pfalz, so she always circles back to kind of the same spots. Yeah. Two brothers get into an argument, and one takes the gun that uh, used to belong to their late father and shoots his brother injuring him, but ultimately the brother survives, and they do find DNA on the bullet casing. Oh, and it's the same DNA? Of course, it's the same DNA. All right, so the brothers, or at least the deceased father, must have known this woman then. Well, the brothers don't know anything about any mysterious woman, and the bullet had been in the gun for a long time, or at least that's what they say. And they can't ask the father because, well, he's he's not there anymore. No. So this leads nowhere. Hmm. And then there are a bunch of break-ins. Many break-ins is like... An understatement. It's so many break-ins. It, it's an understatement, exactly. Yeah. There's so many break-ins. <laughs> so many break-ins. In Austria, in southern Germany, but never in Bavaria. There are break-ins in electronic stores, break-ins in optician stores, break-ins in houses and apartments, break-ins in shops and offices, break-ins in schools, in public pools. And not only break-ins, cars are stolen, bikes are stolen, and the DNA samples stem from sweat, spit, skin, and blood. Okay, so it doesn't seem likely that the DNA would have been planted there, because that would have been some... Super mastermind going back to 1993, right? So that right. seems like too much effort to frame somebody. And especially as it was from different, like, sweat, spit, skin, blood. It was not just blood or just spit. Okay. It was like different kind of sources for the same DNA, right? Yeah. So the woman must have been at all these crime scenes, but how likely is it that you're at all these locations but not involved? Like, you mean she was there always before the crime took place and has nothing to do with it, right? Right. And I think that's highly unlikely. Like, that happens maybe once or twice, but 40 times. Yeah. The other thing is not all of these crimes go unsolved. Some are solved, but the ones charged never open up about any female accomplice. And then, of course, the murder of Michelle Kiesewetter in 2007. 
right? Mm. So the police is once more confronted with the DNA of this criminal mastermind, and they do everything to catch the mystery woman. Okay. That's got to be hard, though. I mean, there's just no witnesses, nothing to identify her, no f- drawings of her face, not even an egg with hair. There's just nothing. nothing. <laughs> there's not even an egg with hair. Nothing, <laughs> not even right? an egg with I don't know. I think they, they figured out that the DNA might be more likely from an Eastern European descendant, okay. like Russia or in that direction. But, I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of petty crime. But also, breaking open a safe with thousands of euros stolen, that's grand theft. Grand theft auto, and then, of course, the murders. The cookie. This, yeah, the cookie. Who breaks into a RV and eats a cookie? Who is this lady? Maybe the cookie was just no good. I mean, how bad could it have been? It's still a c- cookie, right? I, I mean, so, I don't know. I have some thoughts about this, but I don't want to get in my head of myself. So, she's just lucky or taunting the police. I mean, kind of looks like that. But in one way, she seems smart, right? But then yeah. also foolish, because why is it often just her DNA that's found? Why in- would you break into some pl- if you if you're the, this horrible criminal who who murders people left and right and and breaks into safes and and I don't know what why would you take the chance of leave half a cookie behind with your DNA obviously on in it in a water like, bottle like that's and a water bottle this this so weird once they found the DNA on a stone that was thrown I think to break a window or something like that wow. it's just like <sighs> so. At least once the police officers were shot, there must have been a public search, right? Yeah. So after the police officers are shot, she's now publicly called Phantom of Heilbronn. Oh. All right. So she's either very cold-blooded or oblivious. Just no idea that they're even onto her, whoever this is. Yeah, it definitely looks like that. So next there's another murder, or actually three murders. That takes place in Heppenheim, which is a German town between Stuttgart and Frankfurt am Main. On 30th of January 2008, uh, three car dealers are murdered. Their bodies are found on 27th of February in a river near Mannheim. Police soon has two suspects. They also find the car where the bodies of the three victims had been transported. You know, they search for evidence for the trial, of course, and to press charges. And what do they find? Exactly, the phantom's DNA. But again, they can't get the suspects to open up about a possible female accomplice, and no further connection can be found. So none of the crimes are connected, as far as they can tell? No, none of them seem to be connected at all. So now it's 15 years that this phantom is committing crimes left and right, in a radius of roughly 400 kilometers or 250 miles, in Germany, Austria, France, So you know don't mean to interrupt, but I forgot to ask before. So you said that she was never involved in any crimes in Bavaria? Yes. So if you look at a map with all the locations, you can see that apparently she always tried to avoid Bavaria. Okay. So maybe she's from Bavaria and doesn't want to commit crimes in her own neighborhood where she'd be recognized, maybe? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That could be an explanation. Uh, She also often seems to be committing crimes in the same regions. You know, she was, for example, often going to Upper Austria for break-ins and robberies, very often in Rheinland-Pfalz, so maybe there's a connection there. Mm. Hundreds of investigators are searching for the mystery woman. They come up with theories and explanations. They look for her in different criminal organizations. They swipe hundreds of homeless women for their DNA because they had the same thought as you before. Right. They find nothing. The search for the Phantom of Heilbronn costs several million euros. It takes them so much time. In total, she is wanted for her involvement in six murders and over 30 other crimes. Wow. On 7th of October 2008, in Mannheim, two men get into a fight, into an argument. One takes a knife and injures his opponent at the neck. The police is called, they do their job, they look for evidence, they find DNA... It's the Phantom's DNA. No. It's on the apartment door of the victim. How did it get there? Nobody knows. Okay. So, one moment. Could it be... It's not possible that the testing was wrong, right? That the lab fucked up? That 
Like that was ruled out early, right? <laughs> I think you're on to something. No. So over the years, some investigators did have the same thought. What if the phantom doesn't exist? What if it was something else? What if the lab had made a mistake? But the lab technicians were checked and the lab technicians told them that the chances for that are minimal, almost non-existent. Always the same DNA over all those years, even though not all of this evidence was sent into the same lab. Just not possible. Where would be the common denominator? Well, I mean, that would have to be something all of them used while taking evidence, right? Gloves, Ziploc bags, cotton swabs, like... Bingo. <laughs> That's no. a bingo. <laughs> yes. No. For years no. and years, while millions of euros were spent and hundreds of people worked so hard to find the phantom, a woman was working hard in a factory producing and packing goods at Kreiner Bio 1, It's a German-Austrian company that specializes on producing equipment for medical labs. Like cotton swabs. How was that not checked sooner? How? How? Cotton swabs. It was indeed the DNA of one of the female employees that had contaminated the cotton swabs used by the forensic teams. But guess which law enforcement never used the swabs by that company? Would that be the law enforcement in Bavaria? Yeah. That's why there was never DNA found at any of the Bavarian crime scenes. The mysterious female mastermind didn't exist. The phantom was an illusion. The thing was, the company who produced the cotton swabs had never even certified them for the use in DNA testing. The swabs were sterilized, yes, but they had never been explicitly sold for this kind of forensic testing. Yeah, I think that the swabs has to be that are like certified. Yeah, they, they they need to undergo some special treatment, and these were not. So it's not even a mistake the company or the employee really made. Right, because that's got to be that stuff must be done in like a complete clean room environment, right? If yep. if you're doing anything like that, that is wow! All that effort, all the work, all the money spent, all that effort, and all those crimes, and so many still unsolved, and they were looking for Mm. a woman. Mm. It's so upsetting to think about, right? Who murdered these people? Like the murder of Lisa Lotte S., still unsolved. So is the murder of Josef W. Mm. But at least the murder of Michelle Kiesewetter could be solved. Now, this crime is part of a much bigger crime series, a murder spree, and I think it could be a whole episode on its own, or multiple, but... Let me give you a quick recap. It's rather upsetting. Okay. So the murder of Michelle and the shooting of her colleague was probably part of the NSU murder spree. From 2000 to 2006, three neo-Nazis, members of the Nationalsozialistischer Untergrund, or NSU, National Socialist Underground, they committed a total of nine murders. Nine. Up until 2006, not counting Michelle Kiesewetter. Motherfucking Nazis. Neo-Nazis. It's just the worst. Wow. I did not see that one coming. It's a lot. It's... Yeah. It's awful. It's awful. And it's there's so much more in that case. Uh, there is a, is a great documentary on Netflix. I don't know if you have it available in the US. I'm going to check. It's really good, really. Uh, gives you a lot of insight. Yeah. But yeah, the victims were small business owners with migrant backgrounds, uh, eight from Turkey and one from Greece. Their names were Enver Shimshek in Nuremberg, Abdurahim Özidogru in Nuremberg, Süleyman Dashköprü in Hamburg, Habil Kilicin in Munich, Mehmet Turgut in, Ro- in Rostock, Ismail Yashar in Nuremberg, Theodoros Bulgarides in Munich, Mehmet Kubasik in Dortmund, and Halit Jotzgat in Kassel. So all over Germany. That's so sad and infuriating. It's very sad. Yeah. Extremely. It's uh, you, When you learn more about that case, it's very upsetting. Mm. The following is an excerpt from an article by Jacob Kushner for foreignpolicy.com. It was published on 16th of March 2017, titled 10 Murders... Three Nazis and Germany's Moment of Reckoning. Quote, 
To systemically execute a series of murders and bombings in modern-day Germany is difficult. Without funds to buy and build weapons, to travel to stake out the locations and identify victims, and to live for many years in hiding, it is impossible. And so, before they became killers, two of the founding members of the NSU became bank robbers. In October of 1999, the pair robbed two banks in Chemnitz, getting away with more than 68,000 Deutsche Mark, so that's about 39,000 US dollars at the time. Less than a year later, they would commit their first murder. Uwe Bönhardt, Uwe Mundlos and Beate Cheppe, the trio had formed the core of the NSU, were born in 1970s East Germany in the town of Jena. They came of age during the region's transition from socialism to capitalism. Apart from Mundlos' military stint, the three were reportedly unemployed during much of their young adulthood, which wasn't uncommon in former East Germany after reunification. Idle teenagers spent their days at protests and their nights at fights between left-wing punks and right-wing skinheads in darkened streets and tram stations. Some were quick to turn against Jews or recently arrived immigrants from places like Turkey and Vietnam. On September 9th, 2000, Enver Shimshek became his first victim. Shimshek was a Turkish immigrant who owned a business that distributed flowers to roadside stands around southern Germany. When one of his employees went on holiday, Shimshek took over his shift at a flower stand outside Nuremberg in northern Bavaria. At some point in the day, two men, who we now know were Mundlos and Bönhardt, shot Shimshek multiple times inside his truck. He died two days later from his wounds. The next attacks came in quick succession. In January of 2001, a bomb exploded in a cake box in an Iranian-owned grocery store in the northwestern city of Cologne. No one was killed, but the daughter of the shopkeeper was burned severely when she opened it. In June 2001, another man of Turkish heritage, Abdurrahim Ozodogru, was killed by two bullets to the head in a Nuremberg tailor shop. Later that same month, Süleyman Tashkopru, an ethnically Turkish grocer, died after being shot three times in the head in his store in the northern city of Hamburg. Habil Kilic, another grocer of Turkish heritage, was murdered in similar fashion two months later in the southern city of Munich. Mundlos and Bönhardt then committed two more bank robberies, one of which netted more than 48,000 euros. The killings resumed in February of 2004, when Mehmet Turkut was murdered at a döner kebab stand in Rostock. A few months later, a nail bomb exploded in a Turkish neighborhood in Cologne, injuring 22, some seriously. June 2005 saw back-to-back -back murders of Ismail Yasha, a Turkish kebab stand owner in Nuremberg, and Theodoros Bulgarides, a Greek locksmith in Munich. In April 2006, Mehmet Kubasik, a Kurdish immigrant from Turkey, was murdered in his Dortmund convenience store. Two days later, Halid Yozgat, the son of a Turkish immigrant, was murdered in his internet cafe in Kassel. Following those attacks, Turkish residents in both cities held public demonstrations to bring attention to the fact that their loved ones were being targeted for their ethnicity and calling on authorities to bring a stop to it. And yet, investigators couldn't fathom that ethnic Germans could be responsible. In January of 2007, the Baden-Württemberg State Office of Criminal Investigations wrote that, quote, Given that killing human beings is considered highly taboo within our cultural space, we can safely assume that the perpetrator is, in terms of his behavioral system, located far outside of our local system of values and norms. End quote. The final attack, in April of 2007, was on two German police officers who were sitting in a squad car in a southeastern German town. Mundlos and Bönhardt sprayed them with bullets, killing one of them, Michel Kieserwetter, and critically injuring the other before making off with their weapons. The attacks were linked by common threats. Witnesses at multiple crime scenes reported seeing two men fleeing on bicycles. And in all but one of the attacks, some of the bullets were traced back to the same rare gun, a Ceska 83 pistol made in the Czech Republic. And yet, because they occurred in many different jurisdictions over many years, the murders were investigated by different police officers from various departments. None of them made the connection, at least not publicly. Instead, police departments working separately began formulating their own, often bizarre theories of the crimes. In many cases, police without any evidence theorized that the killings were the result of gang warfare or personal vendettas between drug-running Turkish mafias. The bombings were generally treated as organized crime, not terrorism.
Nobody investigated the possibility that the murders were being carried out by native Germans with a hatred of immigrants and those of immigrant heritage. In some cases, police fabricated entire backstories that packed the NSU victims as drug-peddling criminals, and in interviews they demanded that victims' families' members corroborate these scenarios. When family members were unable to do so, authorities told media outlets that the families were stonewalling them out of a code of silence. The media bought it, running stories about the murders with headlines like Turkish Mafia Strikes Again and derogatorily referring to the attacks as Döner Killings after the popular Turkish-German Shawarma dish. End quote. Wow. That was some seriously sloppy police work, huh? It seems like they had a theory and tried to make the evidence fit their theory rather than actually follow the evidence. Yeah. So the whole article is way longer and gives a great insight into all the things that went wrong with the investigation of these murders. I will post the link. I think in the end, even FBI was contacted to profile the murderers and they were like, listen, you should look for, for Germans with a hate of, of immigrants. So yeah, it was really, really bad. Yeah, I think Germany has, am I wrong saying that like, I think Germany, that's obviously a more sensitive subject for them than, I mean, nobody wants to have a country with with ra- racist, hateful people, right? Like nobody wants that. But Germany, especially post World War II is, um, I don't yeah. know, I feel like they're very, they just really desperately don't want to be seen in that way. So I will post the link in the Facebook group. Uh, yeah. you should. All, I will also try to find a link to the documentary. Sounds good. That I saw on Netflix years ago. And as I said, maybe somewhere along the road, this extremely upsetting murder spree will be an episode of its own. I'm not sure yet. That's why I didn't want to go into too much detail, right? Sure. But just to finish this up, let me tell you that on 4th of November 2011, Uwe Böhnhardt and Uwe Mundlos committed yet another bank robbery, this time in Eisenach, where they managed to steal 72,000 euros. Wow. This time they were seen fleeing the bank. They fled to an RV they owned, where they were soon surrounded by the police. The two men first fired shots at the police and then committed suicide. It is highly likely that it was assisted suicide and suicide. After her accomplices had been found out, Beate Cheppe set fire to their apartment in Weissenborn, which caused an explosion. She wanted to destroy the evidence, but the police found a huge, huge, huge amount of weapons and ammunition, including the weapons that were used to murder the nine men. Wow. I don't think I realized initially when you when you mentioned their names, just because they're they're not names that you have here very often, I didn't realize initially one of them was a woman. Beata, yeah. Yeah. Not that, you know, it couldn't be, but yeah. The next day, Beate Cheppe did send out at least a dozen of envelopes to different media outlets containing confession videos. Oh. And on 8th of November, Beate Cheppe surrendered to the police. She basically walked into one police station with her lawyer uh, in tow, and she was sentenced to life in prison. Okay. And it looks like they were also responsible for the murder of Michel Kiesewetter, because the weapons of the two police officers were found in the RV with Uwe Mundlos and Uwe Bönhardt. Mm. Uh, so at least that murder seems to be solved. There is a memorial plaque at the Theresienwiese in Heilbronn that commemorates Michel as well as the other nine victims of the NSU, and their names can also be found at a plaque at the Way of Human Rights in Nuremberg. Wow, what an interesting case. That was... Wow, a lot of twists and turns there. Yeah, there's so much more to the NSU murders, as I said. But, yeah. Um, no, I could see why that would be a hard one to cover. It's a lot of hate crimes specifically, I feel like, are are difficult for us because it's, well, obvious reasons. Wow, thanks. That was, I had no idea. I'd never heard of that case. That was fascinating. I'm just, I think it's so upsetting to think of all the, the wasted resources. I still can't get over her. While running after a person that didn't, I mean, that existed, but didn't exist. So do you have the same, do you have the same sort of end the backlog issues there that we have here or not really? No. Because that's Not that thing. I ever heard of that. Yeah. I know it's with your rape kits, right? Yeah, our rape kits are... Yeah. No, I never heard of that here. Yeah. Because just the idea that they would DNA test on a half-eaten cookie, like, 
Nothing was taken. That's so weird to me. Yeah. Nothing was damaged, but they did a DNA test on yeah. a. That's shock. That's shocking to me. Yeah. Wow. I. It also, you know, what it kind of made me think of a little bit, and you probably know more about this than I do. But when they were doing the DNA testing with Jean Benet Ramsey, did I see something somewhere where they had found like DNA, foreign DNA, on her underwear? But one of the theories was it came from the people who were making the actual underwear. Oh, right. That was one yeah. of, I think I remember, don't quote me on that. And someone someone else can probably pop in on the Facebook group and they'll tell me exactly what I'm remembering. But I vaguely remember there was like foreign DNA on the underwear. And yeah. when you looked at it, it was like, oh, no, you know, thinking all kinds of worst case scenarios. Yeah. But then did it actually come out that it was DNA from the manufacturing process? Mm. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Because I always just heard about the DNA on the underwear. Yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I don't know if it being, I don't know if the source of it has ever been confirmed or if it's all just theory. But that was a fascinating case. Wow. Wow. Thanks. You've got something good for us after this very yeah, so ending. First of all, to you for taking on the lion's share of everything and doing it so beautifully so that I could sort of get my house ready for guests for the first time since 2019. And also a big thank you to my friends and our family who helped get everything, helped our little projects get things ready. I was kind of laughing with Paul last night because I feel like in the last month we've done more, like three years worth of projects that we just kind of stuck on hold, you know, during the pandemic. So <laughs> it so was, funny. I know you do it. <laughs> I know it was like just, just a panicked month and then <laughs> fine. Everything's fine. No, it'll be good. It'll be good. But we needed to get, we needed an extra bedroom. So I had to clean out mm. that room. That's been full of boxes for seven years. It was time. It looks so good. I love it. It's almost ready. We're almost there. <laughs> How about you? Uh, my something good is my nephew. It's uh, today when we're recording. It's his thirteenth birthday. Can you oh, believe hooray. that? Thirteen years old. Uh, we just went over. Well, I just went over there. My mom was there. Uh, my brother, my mom's husband, and we had a little celebration. And I think I'm a pretty pretty cool aunt <laughs> to have around. Maybe a little bit strict, but. I enjoy being an aunt now, even now more so that he goes, gets older. You know what I mean? I do. Like I'm not the, the kid's kid person, but with a teenager, I think I'm, I'm better. I love teenagers. I love those years. I, I think they're really fun. It's easy to say because I'm the aunt. I'm not the mom. So yeah, exactly. But yeah, I'm with you. I, I love being an aunt. It's one of the greatest joys of my life. I love that. Ah, I should find something to send over for him. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, we would be so, so grateful if you could leave us a review, especially if you are on iTunes. It helps other people to find our show. If you need information, any kind of information about us, visit our website, which is freshhellpodcast.com. And there you will find our email address. You'll find our PO box. You'll find ways to contact us, how to listen to us as well as links to our Patreon. If you want more information on our Patreon, you can go to patreon.com and search for Fresh Hell Podcast, and that will give you information on the different tiers and what you get for those tiers. Reminder to our murder tier hellions, please uh, do send us a message through Patreon if you still don't have a pin. We're, we're going to get them to you, I promise. Ask any of the first people who waited ages and had multiple mailings. We'll get you eventually, we promise. Next time we're going to do bracelets or oh something my, like this. Yeah, that. I, yeah once these pins are gone, it, like <laughs> stickers, something easier to mail. <laughs> There's a way to do it. I just am doing things in the most difficult and least convenient <laughs> way possible because that's how I like to live my life, all right? Um, <laughs> is, is it even worth doing if you don't have to do it four times? I mean, exactly. Come on. <laughs> I know half of your address is by heart now. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. But yeah, uh, come say hi on our Facebook group, which is uh, if you search Fresh Hell Podcast Murder, you will find our lovely Facebook group full of a bunch of weirdos that we absolutely adore. Is that everything? 
please tell your pets we said hi, hug them, cuddle them, kiss them. I just posted a meme where they showed different ways of, of petting a dog and like I'm guilty of most of them. Oh, that made me laugh. My husband, <laughs> there was one. And I was really laughing because it's putting your finger when they into their mouth when they yawn. Mm -hmm. And I always thought just my husband is that weird. And I always told him one day they're gonna bite your finger off. Uh, but apparently it was in the meme also, so he's not the only weird person to do that. No, so Paul also go. does that. He also <laughs> likes to boop. It must be a male thing. Yeah, he also boops them when they're sleeping. And I'm always like, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> Let them be. And he's like, I can't. They're yeah. so cute. Boop. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, we love them. We love them all. We love them all. Please post photos. Tell us how you pet your dogs. Be kind to your fellow human being. Don't put your finger in, in strangers' mouth while they're yawning, please. Don't do because it. that could get really weird. It's rude. <laughs> Definitely Ooh, not the first time weird. you meet them. Uh, however you want to call it. <laughs> Be kind to yourself, which is the hardest part. And yes. that's it. That's it. Just those 42 things would be great <laughs> if you could take care of that for us. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and until until next week or the week after, don't forget, we might not be here next week. Don't panic if we're not. Everything's fine. We've just got yep. visitors. And until the next time we, we all sit down to discuss something terrible again, you know, just keep in mind that if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. It gets better. Bye. Bye.